you know, there's pain in growth. There's more pain in not growing. While we're not parents ourselves, we believe children are the future, and we believe in the importance of providing an environment in which they feel strong sense of belonging, connection, and acknowledgement. We think about traditional education models, and these descriptors just don't come to mind for us. What if there was a different way of looking at education? And what if, as adults, we could benefit from relationship-based education and holistic education of our youths? Our guest today is Dr. Josette Lovemore. Josette Lovemore, PhD, specializes in the fields of childhood development and natural learning relationships, consciousness of the developing child, transformational learning, how adult and child grow together, relationship-based education and holistic education, teacher training, and professional development programs. Josette does this all with her husband, Bob Lovemore. They have lived, studied, worked, and played together since 1979. They are educators who have started several holistic education schools, a holistic learning center for families and children, and many whole family immersion programs. They are each adjunct faculty at Antioch University. They founded two nonprofit organizations dedicated to awakening the greatness in humanity. Together, Josette and Ba co-created and developed Natural Learning Relationships, a holistic understanding of child development that supports optimal well-being in children and families. Natural Learning Relationships was the basis and philosophical foundation of the schools, learning center, and programs they founded, as well as in their published work of six print books, five e-books, and magazine and journal articles. They also produced and host the popular podcast series, Meetings with Remarkable Educators. Welcome, Josette. Well, thank you so very much. It's a pleasure to have met you both and to be here on your podcast. Thank you. We do appreciate you being here. Very honored. And we like to start out uh, with our guests by asking, what are you grateful for or how do you develop gratitude in your life? Oh, gratitude is a central focus in my life. I'm grateful for every day to be breathing the clean air and to be in a family. Um, I, you don't know much about my family situation, but, uh, with the, with a husband that I've shared life with for, um, my more than I can say in terms of years and, uh, two grandchildren and my son-in-law. Uh, we all live together in a great big house and I'm very grateful for sharing my life with them. Very nice. So, Josette, you know, our traditional education models usually include reading, writing, math, sometimes history, occasionally gym, and maybe music these days. That's not holistic education, though. What is meant by holistic education? Well, uh, thank you for asking that question. The education of the whole child isn't just cognitive development. It isn't just reading, writing, and arithmetic or... Um, the uh, testing for proficiency. It has to do with the heart, the spirit, um, the emotional development, physical development, social development of the child. In other words, the whole person together. And it is heavily based in relationships um, in, the, in that the teacher is um, very connected to each individual child in his or her classroom and knows the child. So it is relationship-based. Now, as education is in the field of social sciences, all education has a foundation of relationship. I mean, obviously, teachers can't teach without relationship. But in relationship-based education or holistic education, it brings forth learning in the realm of well-being for each participant. And it is inclusive of the whole child, including interpersonal relationships, environment, community, and curriculum. So we recognize that learning is rooted in relationships, and it focuses on the connections between the student and the teacher, between the student and the content or the material being taught, um, that is the interest of the student, between the teacher and the parents. Uh, child, children live in two realms, home and school, and that connection between the teachers and the parents is very important. 
um, so between the individual students and the classroom as a whole. So in relationship-based and holistic education, the we're not teaching to the test. We're teaching to the whole child. We're teaching in relationship to the child's interests. And quite often, um, holistic education schools or relationship-based schools um, employ project-based learning as one of the main methods of teaching, rather than top-down delivery of information and then testing for retention. So it's a different focus. And I think it goes well with um, the five mountains of human development. Uh, the fifth piece, which if I understand it correctly, is called Kokoro. Do I have that right? Which is yes. heart, spirit, soul, mind, all together, the interconnectedness of all things. That is exactly what holistic education focuses on, the interconnection of all things. That we live in the context of our, our environment, that the child lives in the context of their family and is, is deeply connected to that whole system, that the child is, is deeply connected to the context of their, of their classroom environment, and that when we as educators help children relate to the connectedness they have, there's a natural uh, emergence of uh, respect for the environment, respect for themselves, respect for each other. What types of results are you seeing with children in this type of environment? Uh, when I think of traditional schools and learning, I think of kids not being able to pay attention and teachers getting frustrated, kids getting frustrated and being bored. Kids are uh, frustrated and bored when they're learning things they're not really interested in. Um, kids get, like, all. I mean, adults are like this as well. If we work with children to teach to their developmental moment and create their learning environment that incorporates who they are developmentally, takes into consideration the interests of, of the child, works in project-based learning uh, forums and ways that um, each child is learning at their learning edge in a way that they learn best. It can be done, um, creating learning pods within a classroom where each uh, small groups of children can work at their own level or um, maybe upperclassmen can come in and teach younger grade children. Uh, it, it's There's so many different ways it can work. Then you don't have that kind of boredom within the classroom. Now, do, do, do you know, every child has a, um, a learning edge where they get filled up. And one of the things that we do in relationship-based classrooms is we make sure children have body breaks and be able to move their bodies and get outside. And, you know, it's not like one lunchtime, one recess, and that and the rest is all academic download. It's um, body breaks interspersed with, um, you know, with, with learning time or focused learning time. Um, also, we would often have um, fidgets in the classroom or things where kids could get up in, and move to the back of the classroom and do balance boards while they're listening. You know, everybody needs to move as they learn. Not everybody can sit at a desk and just absorb information that way. Some people absorb, some children absorb best with um, uh, visuals. Others absorb best with reading. Others absorb best with um, verbal connection and communication. And one of the things we know in education is that all children learn from those they love. And so the, for the teacher to develop a relationship with each child, it, it's a difficult thing to do in very large classrooms, 25 to 35 to even 45 children a classroom these days. It's really ridiculous in standardized schools. So smaller size classrooms, um, personal relationships with each student where there's a feeling of connection, then children are uh, you have a different kind of learning that occurs there. That's a, that's very interesting to me. You know, some of the information that we've been looking at recently in our own lives is that is that's very important even for adults to get up and take a break from the computer, um, 
perhaps 20 minutes, 30 minutes out of every hour or at the 20 minute or 30 minute mark or the 50 minute mark, get up, move. We like to use uh, spot drills where we may do just some movement exercises, maybe some breath work. We used to do a thing. Uh, there's a, a curriculum program called Awareness Through the Body. And I did it frequently with um, kindergartners uh, all the way up to age 10. But you can do it through the teen years as well. And that would be a series of exercises and games and activities where um, you might do an active activity and then ask them to be aware of their heartbeat and then do a calming activity and see how long it takes for your heartbeat to calm down. And then do um, another activity where everybody walks toward the windows, freeze, feel your heartbeat. Everybody walks towards the door, freeze, feel your heartbeat. Now walk really, really fast. Or another game that we would play is we'd have ping pong balls and spoons. And then we would do relay races where they would trade the ping pong ball into another person's spoon. And all kinds of games like that. But always bringing them back to what's going on in your body right now. And at the end of that whole uh, period, which would be about maybe anywhere from half an hour to 45 minutes, then they would all lay down and 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 cover the floor with their bodies, like spread out where your fingers are just almost touching but not touching your partner next to you, and spread out your legs. And then I would have these really smooth stones. And we would place them on our hearts or place them on our forehead. and then experience the body changing. How does your body change when the stone is placed on your forehead? And how does the body change when the stone is placed on your heart? That is awareness through the body. And that's a very lovely curriculum um, that follows a book by that very name, Awareness Through the Body. So really, it's available to everyone, on, probably on Amazon. Wow. You know, I can't imagine having such a skill set at such a young age. I think now about what it's done for my life as far as being more aware of the world around me and my body in it and being able to have that concept at such a young age. I can't imagine how much power that gives that child. Yeah, I think it does. And I also think like so many children today um, are quickly diagnosed uh, ADD, ADHD, all kinds of problems. And Perhaps uh, some of those things might be biological, but what I've also noticed is helping children become aware of that what control they have to calm themselves down from the inside out. What's within their power? What's not within their power? And give them the tools, and then let's see what's left. Very powerful information there. Thank you. Sort of changing topics, but not really. Um... <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about uh, natural learning relationships. It would be my uh, pleasure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this episode of Fierce Planet Adventures podcast is brought to you by Five Mountain Coaching. Licensed, unbeatable mind coaching. Integrated, accelerated vertical growth across five domains of cutting-edge development. Designed by retired Navy SEAL Commander Mark Devine. Learn the big four skills of mental toughness and resiliency. Discover the six pillars of performance. Test your metal with custom created crucibles across all five domains. Visit fivemountaincoaching.com to schedule your free one hour unbeatable mind coaching session. That's the number five, mountaincoaching.com. Begin your journey to becoming unbeatable today. Natural learning relationships is a uh, appreciation of child development that uh, Bob and I created uh, from our studies, from our internal spiritual practice, uh, from our work with children and observation with children. And over the years, we uh, observed um, that each individual age group has a different worldview, that the child's worldview is, ch is changing as the child grows. When I later on studied the brain sciences, I discovered that each developmental stage, a different part of the brain is dominantly developing and creating neuronal connections and networks. And each age of development needs a different environment and different nourishments from the adults within that environment. And the, we gave each of the developmental stages their own name, which brings focus to what 
part of the brain body mind system is developing during that developmental age and stage. So body being is from seven to nine or eight. Uh, feeling being, the development of feeling relationships with others is eight through 12. The ideal being years, the teen years, is 13 through 17. And then the development of reason or reasonable being is 18 through 23. Each age group is an evolution of the way the child sees the world, the child's field of knowing. What are they capable of seeing, understanding, and knowing? What are the relationships that they need in their environment? What is the optimal mode of communication with each age child? And if by understanding developmental ages and stages, we understand more about how we as the adults need to change with children. So if I have a child in that early developmental stage, which is basically conception through age seven, body being, then I understand that the child is primarily organizing their understanding of the world through relationship, a physical body-centered relationship with the world. They touch, they feel, they crawl over, they crawl under. All their learning tools need to be things that they can touch and hear and sense. It's a sensory-based learning mode. In those feeling being years, it's a relationship-based learning mode, 8 through 12. I and other are in relationships, and the child can feel now a greater depth of feeling, not only into themselves, but into other people's feelings, because we humans grow with the capacity for empathy for others. And this is the age when conscience is really beginning to develop, because conscience requires relationships. So those feeling relationships, which is the midbrain, the vagal system, is developing very strongly, requires under teachers or educators who can create feeling-based environments and create culture with children within the classroom with a sense of fairness and justice and caring. In the teen years, 13 through 17 more specifically, the child is really focusing on I am my own individual. I am becoming my own self. I need social relationships where I can forge a sense of self that is uniquely my own. And even though most teenagers are, 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 are growing within groups and usually have social circles and need social circles to forge their own identities, very similar to their peers, but at the same time, it's uniquely their own, of course. Um, those, those that age group needs to create an opportunity for self-governance. So we need people who are willing to ask more questions than give them more directives and guide through inquiry rather than guiding through telling. And I'll open opportunities for social engagement where they can have food for their um, uh, thirst and hunger for forging their own identity. So social relationships, and also this particular age group focuses heavily on a, 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 a drive toward freedom. And of course, as educators, what we want to do is help them understand, yeah, we all want freedom, but there's responsibilities that go along with all the freedoms we have. For example, if we want to drive a car, we have to take care of that car. We have to make sure it's got the proper amount of gas in it. Or it's not going to go very far. <laughs> so responsibilities and freedom go together, hand in hand. So let's 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 learn what responsibilities go with the freedom that you're looking for. And then, of course, in the in the um, uh, reasonable being years where they're developing true reason, eighteen through twenty three, um, that's the age where they're developing a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning a sense of moving forward into the world with what uh, what are what are the values I want to move forward with? What are more substantive values than just projecting my ideals onto the world and then seeing if the world matches up? But now it's going to be a lot more reasonable of a quest. And it's in the reasonable years where an individual will move from uh, the ability to look at what their, their life has been up to this point what it's yielded for them into who they are now, 
and to project a future that they want and to do what they need to do now to actualize that future. That's a reasonable capability. And we also discovered as we were um, learning and studying and growing in the field of human development that the evolution of consciousness is manifest in the evolution of the human form. That as we go through these developmental ages and stages and the child's worldview changes, what we're noticing is that consciousness is changing simultaneously. There's an evolution of consciousness in the child as they go from focus primarily in relationship to the world through the body, which is a perspective that is um, very magic and, and um, the child is organizing the self in the world as I am the center of the world and the whole world revolves around me. So objects have a magic presence. If I trip over the rock, it's the rock that's stupid or the, the rock that's, you know, tripped me or something like that. Whereas in the feeling being years, that's a more mythical age of development and it's a mythical structure of consciousness that's present there. So it's a very tribal, connected, community-centered structure of consciousness and the child is organizing values with much broader ideals in relationship to community, in relationship to the organization of trust, the organization of um, the cycles of nature and very connected to animals and, and human rights and social justice and things like that. In the teen years, that's the very mental structure of consciousness, very individualistic, not a separate self per se, but I'm not an isolated, I should say, not an isolated sense of self. It is a separate self because I'm an individual now. And so I'm organizing individual agency. I'm organizing a sense of learning how to think abstractly. And my sense of freedom is I can self-offer. I can create a self and I can self-govern. And learning how to self-govern in a healthy way is the job of development during those years. So I can name myself as an individual. In the reasonable being years of development, the, uh, the uh, structure of consciousness is more integral now. And that's, of course, the potential. And Gebser was a firm belief, what I should give credit to Jean Gebser, the structures of consciousness is what we cross-correlated natural learning relationships with, and the structure of con structures of consciousness that he put forward in his birth, the ever-present origin, which was his magnum opus that he created in his lifetime. And we see that the, and um, we aren't the only ones who have noticed that humans, uh, pass through an evolution of consciousness as we grow in our ages and stages of development toward integral or integrated or whole. And it was Gebser's belief that we as a, as, a, as a species are transitioning from a mental structure of consciousness into an integral, integrated whole, uh, which is uh, more uh, presence, more I-thou, more liberated. Um, toward the end of the age of reason, it's a more transcendent opportunity in partnering and, um, and inter seeing ourselves as interconnected with the whole in relationship with systems. Um, it's a, a self-transforming toward um, more integrated, integral, um, uh, centered in meaning and purpose. Uh, so as the child moves through uh, ages and stages of development, their worldview changes, their field of knowing changes, hence their uh, classroom needs are going to change, their learning style is going to change, their communication style is going to change, and the structure of consciousness that they see the world through, that we see the world through, is changing as we grow. That's a very quick download of a, in a nutshell version of what's transforming as we grow through developmental fields of knowing and structures of consciousness that are available to us in each age of our birth. Oh, interesting. Yeah, a few things came to mind here is, you know, we're, we're still uh, navigating the, uh, the COVID-19, the, the pandemic, and 
as I understand it, not all kids are back in school. And, and a lot of kids have been out of the classroom environment and maybe sequestered or not with their friends, especially the, in, through the teen years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've seen it with, with some family members. Any suggestions for parents or, or teens on on what to do having that disconnect from the actual physical mm -hmm. environment of being with your friends? It's been very, very difficult for teenagers. Um, and I speak from the experience of having living with my 15-year-old granddaughter, who was a freshman, started her freshman year this year in a brand new school. Uh, so I have a little bit of experience with uh, how difficult it has been for her. I mean, she's had friends from her middle school years. It's not like they don't have friends. And they've they, they do a lot of FaceTime. They do a lot of um, Zoom calling with each other. Um, at the same time, it's not the same when you're in a classroom with students. Most of them you're meeting for the first time. Now, maybe in your sophomore year or your junior year of high school, you're a little more familiar with your classmates. But in high school, it's not like elementary school where you're with one teacher and you're going through the day with that same teacher and your same uh, classroom uh, uh, classmates through your school day, which is hard enough in and of itself because even that age, being on the computer for so many hours a day is not necessarily um, conducive to their worldview or their way of seeing the world. But uh, the teenage years, it's been very, very difficult. So uh, what we found would be was helpful is making sure we got outdoors. Um, at least if we couldn't do it during the week, uh, on the weekends, uh, making sure we were able to get. Uh, well, we live in Portland, Oregon, so it's, we have access to both the coast, which is an hour away, and the mountains, which are an hour away, each in a different direction. But uh, we made sure we got out to uh, natural environments as much as we could, and then we had a few. Um, uh, we made sure that she had, uh, there were families that who we felt were quarantining also very well. And we each would discuss with each other whether or not we felt safe for our kids to get together since we were both being very safe and very careful quarantining. So at first, the kids would get together in outdoor settings at the park, uh, wearing masks and staying as, as much as they could, staying you know, with social distancing. Mm -hmm. um, so that they could at least have that social engagement. But even with all that, and even with arranging um, outdoor time of social interaction, it's been really difficult for kids to sit behind a computer and have a relationship with teachers they hardly know. Um, the other thing that the schools have been doing is because kids are not in classrooms, they've been giving additional schoolwork when you're not on the computer to make up for what we would have had in classroom time. Which, okay, so now they're off the computer and what are they loaded up with? A bunch of, of desk work. This is not healthy. <laughs> this is not good. And so I have seen kids and our schools, the schools that our girls are involved in are very, um, one is a private school and one is a very conscientious or tries to be conscientious school. And they sent out surveys to the parents to ask us how our kids were doing and questions on mental health and really wanted to know when it would be affected for what the, the uh, computer-based learning and Zoom learning was doing. And I have to say, a lot of parents were saying, it's not, it's not very good. So we're really, really happy to see that our, our governor said, okay, as of April 16th, schools have to go to a hybrid. It's been hard on kids. That's a yeah. long answer to a question. <laughs> it's so important, too. I yeah. think Andy and I both have had um, teenage year uh, family members that saw a decline in some of their performance when they were separated from that environment. And then once they got thrown back in, it was just right back on pace where they yes. were before. Yeah, so yeah. resilient, too. I've seen that, where now they're doing hybrid. And um, in my other granddaughter, she's 11 going on 12. She'll be 12 this summer. She thrives in the social relationship of her, of her classmates. She loves going to school. She loves learning. But the Zoom environment, I mean, great as it is for business meetings and, and you know, these kinds of, of podcasts and things like that, 
I just don't think kids are cut out for that kind of sitting and looking at a screen for that many hours. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Definitely well, agree. The follow-up question I have then is, you know, as schools are opening back up and parents are going back to work, maybe commuting more to the office, what's a way that parents can utilize this philosophy with their kids maybe when they're no longer seeing each other, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that, of course, with the serendipity of the COVID quarantine is that we got to reconnect and rebound and spend more quality time together as families. Um, I would say that um, uh, in terms of work-life balance, uh, make sure well, everybody has to uh, learn Say it a different way. It's our personal responsibility to organize our lives in such a way where we are doing self maintenance that we need to do to stay healthy, whole, and happy personally. Then there's family time as part of that personal maintenance. And as we look at how many hours are we actually home together, if I'm going to work and the kids are going to school again. Let's make use of the time we have together smart, intelligently, effectively. If parents would just take a little bit of time to learn what are the right developmental nourishments to have in the environment so that a child can have access to what they developmentally are cued to look for and use our time smartly and well, Smartly a word? I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is now. <laughs> Sorry, I make up words all the time. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and ever, so just just to use the time we have effectively and fill them with activities that are developmentally appropriate for the children in our lives, then we can, um, I think that's a good balance for uh, work-life balance where we, and in terms of how to get that developmental information, there's, there, it's freely available on our website. Um, we have a section called Natural Learning Relationships where they can access it on the website. Um, should I give my website? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. www.luvmourconsulting.com. So that website has free information. We have several books on Amazon. We have ebooks on Amazon that can be downloaded at very low cost. Um, and you can get the developmental information that way. So we try, and I have um, an Instagram page called Natural Learning Relationships that people can join and just scroll down to all the different uh, posts I've done over this year. Lots of developmental information there. I have a Facebook page titled natural learning relationships it's a group so all you have to do is say you want to be in the group and then i'll uh, let you join and then you can scroll down and get all that information there um I, we just try to make it very very accessible so if you're a reader get the books if you like visuals get the ebooks if you are a social media person go on instagram or facebook or uh, download some some easy to read single page information packets on uh, our website. Um, awesome. there, yeah, that, that's the easy way to do it. But make your time meaningful by knowing what's developing in your child and how to have effective communication and how to create activities that are age appropriate. In, in a more formal setting, what what settings or more formal structure, what, what settings do you see that this type of educational development taking place? You know, schools, um, outside of school, maybe in after school programs. Um, where do you usually see this? Or what, what can you recommend? Um, well, holistic education schools, relationship based education schools, these are primarily the, the, the schools that. Uh, learning beyond Piaget, what's developmentally appropriate for children. Um, and there are, are schools all over the country. Um, there's a resource, 
Terry. I'll, I'll remember before we close. I'll, I'll try and remember. And if I can't remember, I will send you the um, reference to her. To her, uh, she she uh, is a counselor. Works with people. She's a consultant who works with people on finding the right educational approach for their particular child's needs. And she does a great job of recommending um, schools. There's also um, an organization called the International. Council for Alternative Education, and they are accrediting agency for holistic education schools, and they're very, very aware of many schools across the country. They're located in Texas, but they're, they're connected internationally, and um, very good organization. So holistic education schools, relationship-based education schools, outdoor programs, there's a gazillion of them. If you look on the internet, um, are usually very, very good and, and geared for those uh, feeling being years, those teenage years. There's an organization in Ashland, Oregon called um, the Mankind Project and Boys to Men. They are a uh, they do rites of passage for teenagers and for preteens um, called the Raven Project and uh, Boys to Men. I they utilize natural learning relationships in their programs, um, and we've worked with them for several years now, and they're a fantastic organization for helping uh, boys transition into manhood and doing rites of passage with preteen and teens. So uh, that's just to name a few, but more and more these days, there are progressive organizations that are caring about nurturing development um, understanding what's developing in each age of childhood and creating environments that really nurture children for their physical, mental, emotional, um, uh, heart, mind, spirit as well. Nice. That's awesome. Yes. Um, you know, I, I think we had a few more, some more questions around, you know, society and, you know, the, the parent connection here. Um, and, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're not parents ourselves. And so how would we bring awareness to, as a non-parent to, you know, parents that we're connected with about this type of education or, you know, maybe shining a light on some areas where this education could be very useful? Well, um, interesting thing um, I, I failed to mention, I mentioned that that when parents learn about these developmental approaches and actually put themselves in a position to provide the developmental needs of children, quite often we come face to face as adults with our own childhood and what did or did not happen in our own childhood, where those needs may or may not have been met for us. And one of the things that I observed and I did my dissertation research around is that when adults provide these developmental needs for kids, that we as adults grow simultaneously and uh, regain access to former developments that we may not may have missed in our own growth. So as you as you may um, converse with people about their own development or their own um, things that they're noticing as they go through your programs or as coaching them, you might notice that the language they're using really indicates that something is unresolved back there somewhere in their body being years or their feeling being years or maybe in their teen years, that um, as, they, as you start to discuss with them what they need for their own growth, how they might provide that for the children in their care. And of course, not everybody has children, but we all have children in our lives. We may not have our own biological children, but we have nieces, nephews. We have children in our neighborhood. We have neighbors who need a respite from, you know, maybe they need to get something done and, and you can take care of their children. So there's lots of opportunities for being with children in our environment where we can grow with them as we provide their developmental needs we have opportunity to access places that um, 
we may need to grow uh, additionally in our own uh, development. For example, uh, uh, as I connect with a child in their need to belong, I would create safety, I would create security, um, loving touch with an attitude of acceptance. And as I provide these things for the child, what happens for me? Well, I'm enveloped in an environment where I'm creating safety for others. So I'm being of service. And in that service, I feel great connection. I feel a greater sense of um, uh, doing things for the benefit of others and not just for myself. If I'm creating an environment for a feeling being child, 8 through 12, where I am creating an honesty, justice, caring, and the child is developing trust um, and uh, developing um, a sense of um, a cooperation with me, then I am simultaneously organizing trust with myself. I'm feeling greater trust for the emotional development of the child. I can discuss, listen to the child's emotional needs and be a trustworthy person. Then I grow in my own trustworthiness. I grow in my sense of, if I take that child out on um, hikes or let's say we go on a nature walk, or we go watch a sunrise, what's happening for me? I'm out there watching, being inspired by the sunrise myself. And I'm growing in self-trust. I'm growing in deeper connection with nature. I'm growing perhaps in devotion for this great miracle we call life. If I'm with a teenager and taking the teenager out into the world, uh, maybe I'm, I'm doing more social interactions, taking them to places where they can engage more social interaction with others. What happens for me? Well, I get to reorganize my own identities. Teenagers, when you converse honestly with teenagers, they will inevitably put their finger right on our most vulnerable spots. Why? Because they want to learn. And how do you, ha you know, you're going to pretend you don't have this shadow in your background? Well, of course you do. And a teenager will see it and point it out, not because they want to make your life difficult, because they want to know, how do you deal with that? How are you moving forward in the world, knowing full well that you're sort of protecting this part of yourself? So we get to relook at our own identity constructs. We get to look at our own social faces and what we present the world and what we hope the world doesn't see about us. We get to play with identity construction, which is what teenagers are doing. So it's a whole new reorganization of self in relationship to teen development. And in the reasonable being years, we get, uh, you know, if we're really interacting, let's say, with college students, and I teach in the college sector, and I teach both undergrad, but mostly I teach graduate students, which are a little bit older, in their 20s and 30s. But uh, some of them already have children of their own. Some of them are teachers in the making. Some of them are in different walks of life. But if they're in my courses, they're learning natural learning relationships and the evolution of consciousness. So if they're in the reasonable being years when we're interacting with children that age, we're facing uh, all kinds of questions of, of social justice. Of, um, of government, of uh, self-governance, of purpose and meaning in life. And we have an opportunity to reorganize our own sense of purpose and meaning. We have an opportunity to reorganize our own sense of emotional well-being, a rebalancing of our own perspectives on the world, a reorganization of that as well. Listening to reasonable being individuals and their take on world events is always fascinating and enlightening. And invariably, it creates a, hmm, I never thought of looking at it that way, and that we're reorganizing my own perspective in relationship to theirs. Uh, many uh, reasonable being individuals will want to know about, well, what kind of experiences did you go through in your life to bring you to where you are now? What a personal question to ask. And so to answer that question, I have to really consider 
well, who am I? And how do I come to my realizations? And what opportunities do I have to continue to grow in my life? And or where have I blocked that off? Which which sacred cows am I saying? Oh no no, I won't relook at that one over there. But a, a, a healthy teenager or a healthy reasonable being individual will very is like why not? Uh, you know, this is a really interesting. What what is it about that that you find so difficult and, and those kinds of things? Just yesterday, um, I, I hold groups and, and different things like that. For uh, we were holding a group for um, graduates from our program. We do this twice a month. And one uh, person who works with uh, has a lot of reasonable being young individuals in his life. And he's looking at substance abuse with these, you know, that these kids are dealing with substance abuse and, and um, some of them addiction issues. And we, we it launched into a very interesting discussion on where kids do and don't have connection into those worlds. And how essential connection is. Not only connection with ourselves, but connection with others, connection with nature, connection with the grand scheme of things, you know, the universe. And without that connection, uh, where do kids turn for inspiration? So we were, it just launched into a very interesting discussion on. Um, creating inspirational opportunities where kids can experience deeper connection, uh, such that um, whatever they're they're getting out of the substance use is being satisfied in a different kind of way, where there's real connection. Well, what happens for the adult who's going to provide that kind of guidance for an individual is invariably we're going to feel deeper connection. We're gonna, some of our sacred cows are going to get aired out. A little bit, and and maybe um, be challenged, and um, you know, there's pain in growth. There's more pain in not growing. So, what's the opportunity to go through that dip for our own growth and growth with these these individuals who are asking really meaningful questions about our world today? Um, so. I encourage people to to have relationships, to learn about the evolution of consciousness through childhood, to learn about what environments we create for children that brings forth their innate capacities. And if we find children in our lives that we can do that for, or volunteer for a, uh, um, uh, camps or um, park park counselors or very different organizations that we can volunteer for where we're in touch with um, providing healthy environments for children, we invariably will grow ourselves in relationship to the children we're mentoring. You know, the, the organization Boys to Men that I was mentioning in Ashland, Oregon, that does uh, rites of passage for um, the Raven training for the preteens and then the, the uh, Boys to Men for the teenagers. The men who do that uh, and the women who do that volunteer. They're all volunteer, and they get trained as volunteers. They, what they, the things that they have told me, the growth that they have experienced themselves by serving this population of youth, bringing them forward in their mentoring uh, from boys to men and from into the preteen to the teen years is been phenomenal. The volunteers have told me time and time again, I get as much out of this, maybe more, than the kids are getting out of it. So I would say go volunteer for a youth organization. I would yeah. absolutely agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Long answer to a short question. <laughs> oh, really? yeah. Uh, I volunteered quite a bit uh, in my younger days, more uh, later teen years, but uh, where we took troubled teenagers or teenagers in trouble at school or the law yeah. instead of being put into a community service type program we would take them out backpacking into just an environment where they didn't have those everyday comforts and put them in situations where they had to trust someone else oh, and awesome. being able to see them change right in front of your eyes it really yeah. does something for your own personal energy 
Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, would you say that, you know, why it made you self-reflect? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Very much. And I still still go back to that. It's been many, many years, but I do still go back to that even today. It just what a profound experience it was and being able to help someone through a difficult time, especially at that age where many people don't have that type of support in their life at that age is it does a lot it really does they're so vulnerable and they're so open and just being around that kind of openness uh, what would you say the biggest change for you was i would say it was also the being open it's uh at the end of the night or the day we would set up a campfire and sit around and talk about what we learned and I was always hesitant to share but after watching some of the these kids share what they go through at their home life and how this experience was helping them move through life in a better way mm-hmm. just was really inspirational to me to do a little bit more digging and share a little bit deeper experiences that's really beautiful i i'd say that you know it it, it it for me it deepened compassion it deepened a sense of love um it deepened a feeling of uh, connection and how fragile life is yeah it's a great Very opportunity well it's a really great opportunity absolutely and in my work i've noticed that when people do that they, you know, first of all, we do it as parents, then we do it as grandparents, we, have, we do it as aunts and uncles, we have opportunities there. If we're teachers, we do it as, you know, we teach a child in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, every time, every grade we teach, we have a new opportunity. Every year in September, we start with a brand new set of kids, we have new opportunities for growth and connection. And then when mentors who mentor children, like you're talking about, every ch- every program we begin we have a new set of opportunities with a different set of kids and the feelings uh, you know we watch everybody change going from closed and protected to oh can i trust this is it really a safe space to oh this is going to be okay these people are really listening to me oh my god and then that openness starts to blossom you know first first the resistance but then that openness and that's when you just feel I would move heaven and earth to make this place safe for this kid to come out, you know, because it's so important and so fragile. And bonds are made there that last a lifetime. Yeah, absolutely. Kids, kids end up, those, they, they come into those programs, you know, uh, they're protected, very you know, fragile. They end up hugging each other, exchanging phone numbers. I'm staying in touch with you no matter what. You're my lifelong friend. And they're, they make, they, they're just so uh, warm and open and connected by the time they leave. Absolutely. And that particular situation where uh, the teens we were going out with were forced to be there. So they uh-huh. often started out very yeah. almost resentful. resentful and <laughs> by the end of it, we're all sharing and open and on the same level, no matter what age we are. Right. So it's right. a very beautiful connection in that way. It is. And, and of course, our job as the adults in those kinds of situations is to share, but share developmentally appropriately. Right. And that's one of the mentoring I did with the Boys to Men group is, is to help the volunteers understand your sharing is very important, but don't give a kid more than they can, you know, adult level type information. <laughs> they, they can't really they have nowhere to, know, nowhere to put that. But, right. but, you know, they do need us to open, but in a developmentally appropriate way. Right. And, and, and it, it, you know, it leads, in my opinion, I will not much as my opinion, people would tell me it leads to wisdom. I agree to that. Absolutely. Yeah. Casey and I were talking before the podcast here. And, you know, in a society, you know, especially with what we're going through right now, I think, Many adults are just barely hanging on themselves. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I think we're all set up with quarantine. <laughs> yeah. You know, any, any, I mean, I think you, you encapsulate or give us a lot of information here, but any little last wisdom, tips of wisdom or thoughts around how, you know, parents who are struggling themselves might use this information to, you know, to help themselves um, and the, the childhood relationship? Well, I, you know, if you, if you do take the time to, to access the information, whether it's from our website, Amazon, or any of the other things I mentioned earlier, places you can access it, it's always nice to self-reflect, to take some quiet time, to take a look at what was my biological past? What was my biography? Um, in, in our courses, we uh, um, teach the developmental information, and then uh, midway through the course, each learner needs to create their own personal autobiography with the, through the lens of natural learning relationships. What nourishments did I get? What nourishments did I not get? What were the people around me? What was my environment like? Things like that. Taking that time, a little bit of quiet time each day to self-reflect, maybe even journal if you're, if you're somebody who likes to write. Uh, if you don't like to write, maybe even speak into your um, uh, little device, <laughs> recording <laughs> device, whatever you have. Um, but ways to ways to reflect um, about your own personal biography, uh, ways that you could. Uh, I have a, a process of of self-development or of adult development that I recommend highly in my book, uh, Grow Together with Children in Your Life, is called um, self-observation, self-reflection, and self-inquiry. It's a three-part process. First of all, we're always self-observing. Internally, we know what we're doing all the time. We may not admit it to the world, but we know. And sometimes we stuff that information away. Sometimes, uh, you know, we, we self permanent we do a lot of things with that self-observation. But with that self-observation, taking quiet time to self-reflect. Gee, I could have done that differently. All right, next time I will. Well, like, with a little bit of kindness, not like self recrimination kind of type of thing. Not criticism, but just reflection. Uh, and then... On the part places where uh, we find ourselves reenacting things that we were unconscious and now we're making them conscious, that's where self inquiry comes in. How did I decide on that action? Where did that decision come from? How did I approach it this way? Why not another way? Gee, that sounded awful lot like my mother. Oh my God, I hope I didn't sound like that. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know, that kind of self inquiry. Not self-recrimination, not self-judgment. We really have to stay away from self-recrimination and self-judgment, but just self-inquiry. Oh, that was my mother, and I really want to change that. You, we get to go back and say, you know what? I made a mistake. I want to do that differently. I want to say that differently. I, I, have a, I had a really different intention. We could do that with our partners. We can definitely do that with children. That Children are so forgiving. As long as we you know, keep our word, but um, assuming we keep our word and, and we say, you know, I made a mistake there. I, I was just really tired. I want to go back and do a do-over. Kids will say, okay, all right, mom, let's do it this way. And um, and going back and admitting our mistakes, nobody expects kids don't expect us to be perfect. What they want is honesty. They want because they sense the uh, the truth, don't they? They can see it. They sense it. So if we go back and we say, oh, I can't believe I, that was my mother coming right out of my mouth there, and it's not really what was in my heart. What I want to say is, you know, let's do it this other way. And then, so we can go back. We can, we can correct. So I would say make sure you take some time each day, some quiet time, be it in the garden, in the bathroom, Wherever you have that place and space where you can just self-reflect and do a little self-inquiry, I think you'll find it very beneficial. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Um, it was a very important topic. 
and thank you for sharing your powerful and impactful work that you and Bob are doing. Um, we're so grateful for both of you. Well, I'm very, very, very privileged to share it with you, and thank you so much for your time.